Jones. When they had their first child, um, her name is Luisa, Luisa. and they're, they're their oldest one, and she was born at Gary Lake, March of 1952, and their first child was Daphne. Yeah. Yeah. So how did they know she was Daphne? They started um, noticing that when she was sleeping, uh, when people were talking, she wouldn't she move, wouldn't hear, make wouldn't any movements, and um, yeah. she, she wouldn't hear anything. Yeah. And that's when they got suspicious, and they started thinking she must be deaf. And the only time she would um, he seemed to hear was only when they touched her. When they touched her like that. Okay. When she was a uh, newborn, from newborn, um, they didn't know that she was deaf until. Uh, she started getting older, older, and that she couldn't hear. Yeah. Back then, they didn't have doctors. She was born in an igloo. Uh, so then she got a little older, and then they started to communicate by signing to her. Uh, the only way they would communicate with her was by touching her after they found out that she couldn't she hear couldn't and that she was deaf. Um, they couldn't even stomp their feet because there was nothing to, nothing to vibrate yeah. on the yeah. floor or yeah. anywhere. Yeah. So the only way they would contact her was by touching her. Yeah. And that's when they found out she was she deaf. To hang it, Maxo, Mangamalun, the house, Madame Mitting over to hang in the kitchen up to go kitchen. When she was two years old, when they were, you know, when they moved to Baker Lake, um, they finally went to a nursing station, I guess, and uh, after they found out that she was deaf, um, the uh, health, health people started. Uh, showing them video of um, um, how deaf, how they should be uh, dealing with deaf people okay. because they didn't have any idea no. how to yeah. Um, yeah. deal with a little girl who was deaf. Right. When my sister was two years old, um, uh, there was only her older sister and their two kids uh, that were left alone because the. Uh, my father and others had to try and, uh, they had to uh, walk to try and uh, catch caribou because sure. back then there was uh, some uh, famine going on yeah. <clears throat> and there was just two little kids when uh, they were left alone and they had to try and uh, catch something to eat because they, back then they didn't have nothing okay. to eat. Okay. There was quite a few termites around, but they had to throw rocks at them in order to catch them, and they finally caught one. Yeah. And they walk, started walking back to their place, and when they went home, um, Luisa was gone, and um, and my mom went out looking, and she was looking around. She couldn't uh, find her, although she knew she couldn't hear, she would call her name out, yeah. Luisa, Luisa. And uh, when she looked further up, going up, she saw this tiny little thing walking up and uh, she said she had to uh, try and go 
because she was already pretty far. Yeah. And uh, she was quite worried about her because she can't hear. And what if something was to uh, be going close to her and she won't hear? She tried really fa going fast uh, to try and catch her, but she was walking pretty fast. And um, <laughs> And that same year, following year, in the fall, uh, my mom was told that uh, Luisa had to leave and she didn't know what to say and um, she had no choice but to let her go and she was only like almost three. When she was three years old, uh, they told her that she'd have to leave uh, her family. She was only three? Yes. And they sent her down to Winnipeg when she was three years when old. she was three years yes. old? Yes. And they kept her in Winnipeg for a long time, and only after my parents moved to Rankin, they finally sent her to Rankin. Winnipeg, me and ya, me and the job, me and the work, and the work, Winnipeg, me and the job, and the work, and the work, and the work. Um, when she was down in Winnipeg, uh, she would be staying with foster home. Uh, foster parents and after that she was in Winnipeg for so many years yeah, and later on she was sent to Vancouver to attend high school. Yeah. Uh, they would both be crying uh, before they would uh, depart from each other and they had no choice and no, they no. had no choice at all but to let her go and they would both be crying. Uh, after having Luisa, she had another another girl uh, who was deaf, but she was adopted to her sister. Oh, okay. And then uh, she had Philip, Philip. Uh, who is also deaf. And then JM, JM. who is deaf. deaf. And then Johnny. Johnny. They were in uh, a famine area and they were like very hungry all the time and only in the winter time they would have tea. Yeah. And they would be trading fox fur to uh, Baker Lake. Okay. To the Hudson Bay. Uh, back then when they were fur trading, um, they didn't have any money so they would be trading them with uh, little blocks or little sticks uh, they would be using them to trade their food with. Okay. <laughs> With her first one, she uh, had a hard time, but the other uh, three, other four, uh, she got used to because easier, it was a lot easier for her uh, knowing that they are deaf too. And yeah that she was going to be coping with them. Yeah. But uh, for her youngest one, who's, uh, his name is Johnny, Johnny. Um, she had a hard time. Well, she felt uh, for him because when she would try and uh, tell him to go to school, uh, he would not want to go to school and make excuses such as the school is not, the school is smelly and that he gets headaches from them. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but he, she's very proud of him because he finished high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Graduated from school. Yeah, yeah. For Philip, uh, he attended a uh, school for the deaf in Winnipeg, but um, apparently his foster parents were um, mistreating him. Yeah, yeah. And um, my mother was worried that once he gets uh, bigger, that they were going to have a hard time with him. Yeah. And um, the way he was uh, telling my mom was uh, that his foster parents were uh, mistreating him. Yeah. And uh, as soon as he wanted to stop going to school, yeah. my mom just uh, you know, said, OK, that's it. Yeah. he's not going back to school. Yeah. Stay home. Yeah. They would have a hard time 
putting him on the plane, and that's when she, okay, she's, he's not going back to school yet. And uh, when she went to education uh, to find out if Philip can go to school here, in uh, the, yeah, in the schools here, um, they were telling her that um, it's it costs too much to uh, bring up any kind of equipment to use for uh, teaching deaf students, and uh, she asked them, why is it so uh, expensive when other stuff that you try and get are the same amount, and yeah. that's when they, uh, you know, accept started accepting uh, the fact that they're going to have students who are deaf in the school. Right, in the school. Yeah. 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 No, she doesn't have very much to say now, but all she wants to say is she's very thankful. At least she has uh, not just one child who is deaf because uh, the other siblings who are the other four yeah. are deaf. Um, they can really communicate oh, with yeah. each other and yeah. even though they're really communicating, you can't hear them, but they enjoy themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, I appreciate, uh, I accept the fact that uh, they are like this. Right, right. But there, uh, everybody is happy using with sign them. language, everybody is accepting them, mm. everybody is communicating. Mm. Yes, uh, they all get along with the whole family, yeah. including the classmates that they have. Yeah. Like they all know their uh, uh, sign language. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and they communicate with each other. They do communicate yeah. with each other. Uh, the best advice that uh, my parents, Monica and Thomas Ujuk, would give is, Sam, um, you know, when you have your first child, uh, you're not going to know the difference whether the child is deaf or uh, hearing. Um, the only way you'll find out is um, by noticing how how they're sleeping without ever, you know, uh, hearing all the noise. And but in today we have uh, uh, technology, and um, that's the technology that we have today. Can, today can tell them right away if they're deaf or, or not. And um, the advice also is uh, if you know that you have a child who is deaf and if you have children who are uh, hearing, um, they would like to see that all of them be treated equally, equally. Don't mistreat your child just because he or she is deaf. You have to treat them all the same. All the same. Good. And his advice is, uh, you know, it's about the same as what my mom said. Um, for those uh, future uh, parents to be, if you're, if you have a child who is deaf mute, please treat them equally. They're uh, human beings, just like all of us, and, and they want them to be uh, treated all the same. <laughs>